Good afternoon, and welcome to the American Antiquarian Society, whether you are here in person or whether you're watching this virtually. This is a good day. This is a special occasion that occurs only once every several decades here at AAS. So I'm going to take you back almost three decades to the AAS annual meeting on October 16th, 1996, when Ellen Dunlap spoke these words. The sense of community here at AAS transcends and bridges the generations. Those of us on staff today follow in the footsteps of our predecessors. Our mission is the same as theirs was, to collect, preserve, to catalog, and to share our nation's history. And we make progress by building upon their accomplishments. Their portraits watch over our work and their legacies inspire us. Their presence reminds us daily that the community that they helped to build here at AAS has a proud history and a bright future. That day, almost 28 years ago, Ellen was talking about the portrait of her predecessor, Marcus McCorison. It's a privilege and an honor to serve as Ellen's successor and to welcome you here today for the unveiling of her portrait. Ellen has told me repeatedly that today's occasion is about the portrait and not about her. <laughs> because we celebrated her accomplishments at the retirement party in November, 2020. In only mild rejoinder, I would say that we didn't at that time get to celebrate her together in person. We all raised our glasses from our home screens. It's not the same. So I will say just this about Ellen, as you will soon see in the big reveal, her portrait befits its subject, who brought the American Antiquarian Society into the 21st century with works and ways that go far beyond the merely chronological. Under her leadership, AAS entered the digital age as millions of pages of our collections were scanned for wider access, under her leadership, AAS expanded Antiquarian Hall itself twice in major capital campaigns. Under her leadership, AAS broadened our community of researchers and of inquirers to include creative artists, teachers, and many others, including the Worcester cultural community, many of whom are represented here with us today. Many people have had a hand in what we're celebrating today, and I want to say some words of thanks. We are joined by portrait artist Joe Hay, who will speak later about the process of creating this work. Lauren Hughes, Vice President for Collections and Andrew W. Mellon, Curator of Graphic Arts, has worked closely with Ellen and with Joe throughout this process. Kristen Balish, Vice President for Finance and Administration, has worked with Joe and her representative Carolyn Kramer on all the requisite agreements. Lynn Swain, Vice President for Advancement, has organized today's events. My thanks to them, and my thanks especially for the, to the four chairs of our council, the AAS Governing Board, who have generously underwritten the cost of this work. Our current chair, Paul Sperry, his predecessor, Jock Heron, who I would describe as the mastermind behind it all. His predecessor, Sid Lapidus, and Bob Barron, whom Ellen recruited as council chair soon after she arrived at AAS in the early 1990s. Paul, Jock, Sid, Bob, we are grateful for your generosity, not just in this portrait, but in your dedication to AAS over many years. You'll hear next from Jock, who served on the council nearly all of Ellen's time as president and who chaired the council in Ellen's last year as president, then from Ellen herself about the experience of being, shall we say, portraitized. Then from Lauren Hughes, who literally wrote the book about portraits about at AAS. And then we'll have the big reveal. And after the big reveal, portrait artist Joe Hay will talk about the process of creating this. Once installed in this very room, 
Ellen's portrait will watch over this very reading room. Her eyes from behind her famous, and I would say fabulous glasses, <laughs> welcoming old and new friends into this space where she has welcomed so many people for so many years. Her portrait will bring this reading room into the 21st century, just as she has done for the American Antiquarian Society. And now it's my pleasure and privilege to turn this over to Jock Heron. It's my, <laughs> my great pleasure to be here and this great celebration of both Ellen and the portrait, which we'll see in a moment. And they're very wise in figuring out who would do what. I was not allowed to unveil the portrait. All sorts of accidents could have happened, but they didn't. Uh, any event, presidential portraits uh, can be quite fraught. Um, the country got off to a really kind of a deceptively easy start with Gilbert Stewart and with uh, George Washington. I think there are about 100 of those copies done and ended up on, a, on the dollar bill, et cetera. So we're off and going. We ran into some problems with LBJ, however, when LBJ was painted by Peter Hurd, who had been trained by N.C. Wyeth and also uh, actually married N.C. Wyeth's daughter, I believe. He painted a portrait, which I think any of us would look as a, a brilliant likeness. And LBJ said that that was the ugliest thing he'd ever seen. Um, that will not happen today, I'm sure. Um, and even with Obama, the most gracious person imaginable, uh, when Kahindi uh, Wiley painted this incredibly lush portrait with all the flowers, the symbols behind it, and this thing, he did complain that basically Kahindi hadn't paid enough attention to the major instruction he had don't make my ears as big as they are. Uh, so, and he didn't like the gray air either. But in any event, I think we've avoided that, but we'll be the judge of all this. And, uh, but anyway, with Ellen, so when Ellen was resigning, moving on after this extraordinary career, Lauren and I kind of double teamed. We have to sort of get a portrait, of course. We have more than enough, you know, as, as you documented, Lauren, uh, older white men, some with beards, kind of cool people, but in general, kind of, uh, we didn't have. And so the idea was let's do something more adventurous. Let's get out there and get Ellen really on board. Well, Ellen, I would say, was a little bit reluctant at first. Um, she, I think, was happy to be invited and all that, but was sort of cautious about it. And uh, I think that um, it took a while to get things going. Now, it might have been a little bit of the concern of uh, your predecessor, not because of him, but that portrait of Mark McQuarrison doesn't quite get Mark. So this eerie kind of uh, look to him. And the same with Ted Shipton, Mark's predecessor, which has kind of a flat, dullish kind of look to it. So the AS wasn't a uh, place to start. Here's how to get sort of a contemporary portrait. And so there's a little, a little bit of a pushback. And I think uh, we had different ideas that maybe we get Frank to do a large portrait set in some country bar or something like that. It would be great on these trips. <laughs> or maybe um, with that large photo, blow up the photo of you and, and, and uh, uh, Barack and company, just have this massive picture of that. Barack Obama, we were getting the gold medal. Uh, but anyway, I think the real turnaround was when the two of you went on this trip to Alaska, 6,000 miles or something, because I think when you came back about two or three late years later, not enough from that, but in terms of when, Ellen, when Lauren and I, you and I got back on this, we're going to make this happen, you were kind of all on board. And as we know, when Ellen gets on board, everything happens. And so an incredibly short period of time, and the idea, I know you had an interest in getting a, a woman portraitist um, and having kind of a New England base for that. So you had some ideas what to do, but we had some galleries to recommend, but you really did the research as you do on the internet. And Joe was so delighted that uh, who should come up. So you, you found Joe, which is fantastic uh, in, in every kind of way. I had a long conversation with the dealer and your partner, uh, Carolyn Kramer, who was incredibly helpful in terms of getting some of these pieces put together. And then we had a great meeting with Ellen, with Scott, with Lauren, with Joe and myself, um, and you two hit it off. That was just sort of this kind of uh, important part of it and to get the idea of what we're, what we're going to do here. So I think that made a huge difference. And then Scott had the radical imagination to take a kind of a modest portrait into a very substantial portrait and to take a lot, take it into a whole new step of things of sort of how it's going to be shown in this room. And I think that's made all the difference in the world in terms of both, not just a statement, but it's also because it's a beautiful portrait and it's a beautiful portrait that reflects the period in which it's painted, which I think is an important part as we look forward. So I think it's a great thing. It's been lots of fun to work on. And I think the fact that sometimes waiting and being a little bit reluctant and taking some time to get it right, because it wouldn't have been right if we'd done it too quickly. So I think this is great. 
The photograph would have been brilliant, though. That would have been quite fun. And we can still do that. Anyway, thank you so much. It's been great working with you on this. It's so much fun. And Joe, you as well, for sure. And I think we move on to uh, uh, Ellen, the star. <laughs> great. So, Doc's right. I was reluctant. Um, but it wasn't necessarily about having my portrait made. Uh, I respect the long tradition that Lauren will talk about. But I think at that point, it was really decision fatigue. I've had to make a lot of decisions. You know, all the easy decisions in an organization make themselves or other people make them. It's the hard ones that get kicked upstairs. And uh, usually there's matters of some controversy. Some people think it should be one way. Some people think it should be another. And I would have to make those calls and there would be winners and losers and there would be opinions <laughs> about decisions. And, uh, you know, I learned to share the credit when the decisions were good and accept the blame when they were bad. Um, but I also know that when you're trying to move the institutional needle, sometimes you have to piss a few people off with the decisions that you make. And probably some people will be a little bit dismayed at the decision we've made, but I don't care. <laughs> the great thing about decisions in retirement is that uh, it's like, do you think I have to wear socks with these shoes? Or, you know, can I watch one more YouTube uh, video before I get out of bed? You know, and the great thing about the decisions is that nobody has opinions about them. And uh, that was really uh, my reluctance. But my other reluctance was how do you go about picking a portrait artist? I mean, I didn't even have the vocabulary to say what I wanted. So I just started Googling and um, I found this multi-year archive on YouTube of a British TV series called the Sky Arts Portrait Painter of the Year. And they take professional and amateur artists that are competing head to head to earn a major portrait commission. And the competition is based on live sitting with a celebrity, a British TV star or something. And they only have four hours in which to complete a portrait. But the thing that I learned in watching this over and over again, lots of episodes, was that uh, despite the style or the medium, it's all about capturing the likeness, you know, and, and the artist seems to know well, when they've ca captured it. So I knew that I wanted my portrait to be distinctive, uh, but also recognizable <laughs> as me. So as Jock said, I thought, I, well, it would be great to have a woman artist. It would be great to have a Massachusetts artist. And it would also be great to have a person who had a track record of capturing uh, females. And um, as I Googled more, I came across Joe Hay and a uh, British American painter uh, living and working and prolifically in Provincetown. And when I found her series of portraits of women, which she has called the Persisters, I was blown away. I was just captivated by how she had captured these iconic women leaders, elected officials, activists, sports stars, as well as, uh, as, well as women who have been inadvertently thrust into the headlines. Uh, she also has done a series of uh, male magi magicians, musicians, um, Elton John, Freddie Mercury, Prince, which she cleverly calls the rocker fellas. <laughs> But I was captivated uh, by her style, but still kind of at a loss for how to describe it. But I found her own description in an interview that I found. She said, I try to keep my work feeling as alive as possible. To do this, I rely on paintwork appearing to be a state of resolve and collapse simultaneously. Up close, it can just look like a group of random paint marks and unexpected color, but stepping back, it comes together as believable, solid form. I find her portraits of women to be celebrations of female identity and individual self-expression, what we wear for a necklace or how we do our hair. And she captures each of these subjects so um, cleverly. 
When I took the job here, uh, I was often asked, how does it feel to be the first woman president of the American Antiquarian Society? And my standard answer was, I don't feel any different. I've been a woman all my life. <laughs> But if there is any lingering reluctance on my part about this portrait, it is as someone would mistakenly assume that I was putting myself on par with Joe's superstar women subjects. I am honored to be included by association with them and honored by the months and months of work that Joe has dedicated to this commission. I also want to express my sincere thanks to all of those within this AAS family who have had a hand in making this portrait and this day possible. It's been the honor of my life to be associated with this institution and with all of you, and I'm pleased to have that association memorialized and continued. Thank you. We're getting closer, I promise. I'm Lauren Hughes. I am, as Scott said, the Vice President for Collections and the Andrew W. Mellon Curator of Graphic Arts here at AAS. One of my first projects here back in the early 2000s was to research the Society's collection of 170 portraits for a book that was published by AAS in 2004. So my goal in the next five minutes is to use that experience to provide context for the Dunlap portrait, the newest work to be added to the collection and the very first to be created in the 21st century. The portrait collection at AAS is made up of two groups of works, portraits of people whose family or business papers, their books, their newspapers, their music is here at the society. And then the second group, which is our portraits of leaders and members of the organization. Our founder, Isaiah Thomas, started the latter group when he bequeathed his 1818 portrait to the society in 1831. That's the image that's hanging in the lobby that you all walked past on your way in. It must have looked curiously modern, hanging among the portraits of 18th, 17th and 18th century clergymen that Thomas had secured from the descendants of the Mather family at the time. AAS has actively commissioned images modern corporate portraits, if you will, of its leaders since 1836, when the council hired Boston artist Chester Harding, one of the preeminent modern artists of the era, to paint a portrait of Christopher Columbus Baldwin, our then librarian, for $167, which included the frame. More likenesses of AAS presidents and librarians were commissioned consistently throughout the following decades, a history documented in the society's archives and proceedings in remarkable detail. We saved everything, every receipt, everything. In the 19th century, the 1878 diary of the then 79-year-old Stephen Salisbury records his numerous sittings for his AAS commissioned portrait by Daniel Huntington, who was then the president of the National Academy of Design in New York. It took seven sittings, of which Salisbury complains. The total price was $1,000. The AAS archive also documents the society's hiring of a Dusseldorf trained painter, Edward Custer of Boston to paint Samuel Haven, who's right up there behind you. That was only $300, but it didn't include the frame. Again, we have all the receipts. We have all the receipts. Haven oversaw the society for more than 40 years, bringing us through the Civil War and moving the collection into our second building in Lincoln Square. At the unveilings of both of these 19th century paintings, those in attendance remarked at the accuracy of the likenesses of both men. They celebrated their contributions to the society. They recognized the modern challenges that they had faced during their tenures. And it sounds very familiar, right? This is what we have just been doing for the last 15 minutes. These were paintings of living people. And while they might look fusty and dated to some of us today, when they were new, they reflected the artistic taste of the era. More portraits followed in the 20th century, including Waldo Lincoln, who's hanging here up behind me opposite Haven. Lincoln uh, is famous for hiring the librarian and future director Clarence Brigham at AAS in 1908. I feel like that's the, always the first thing that is said. Oh yes, he's the one who hired Brigham. He also orchestrated the move of the library into this space from Lincoln Square in 1910. His portrait was painted when he was 80 years old. It was done by a UK artist named Frank Salisbury, who was in New York in December of 1929. 
The painting was paid for by 15 members of the society who subscribed to the, to the process because the purchase took place during the financial events of the Great Depression. Two sittings, $1,300 framed. And no complaints, by the way. <laughs> he apparently was a very gracious guy. Lincoln is wearing his 1920s business attire, love the pinstripe pants, right down to his rimless eyewear and his pearl tie pin. Thoroughly appropriate, maybe even dapper for the times. So as Scott mentioned in the opening remarks here this morning, the portrait most recently commissioned by the council of, AAS, of an AS leader before this one was that of our librarian turned president, Marcus McCorson. That painting was added to the collection in 1996, 28 years ago. I have staff who were not even born at that time. So just for some perspective. Today, we are moving into the 21st century with the unveiling of the newest AAS commission, a portrait of our president emerita, Ellen Dunlap. Scott and Paul, please come up for the big reveal. Come on up, Joe. Now a few words from the artist, which is an honor. This is the first time I think the artist has been in the room. Unless was the artist at Marcus's? Oh, no. No. I, I visited with- Yes, but I mean, this is the first time at an unveiling- oh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, corporate yes. portrait that the artist has been here. Oh, yes. I approve. Yes. I, <laughs> um, thank you very much. I just I, I want to tell you or explain how overwhelmed I am at this moment. I mean, this is this is a phenomenal honor for me. Thank you very much, Ellen, for deciding that I would be the painter of your portrait and to the, uh, the society for all of the other pl players in this decision that made it happen. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. This is an extraordinary honor. Um, it's it's a different portrait for me than the Persisters portrait because I have gone to those women looking for reference material to paint them. In this in instance, Ellen came to me. So the relationship between, to the work is different before I even start. But it was exciting to me to, to, to figure out, could I, could I make a portrait of somebody that I don't know as well as I know the other women? I know them visually. I don't know them. They're, they're predominantly politicians, etc. Could I make a portrait that people who knew her believed it was her and felt that it was her. And that's that's always my goal with the other the paintings. Um, I felt that I did it. I, and from your response, I feel like there's there's some belief that you you see Ellen in it too, which is just extraordinary. It's it's lovely. Uh, it's the process of making it is is I like to have a month to six weeks at least. If I have a little longer, that's fine because it's a it, it's an accumulation of marks, and I feel like it's a recording of my sense of Ellen over that period of time, rather than if I just did a you know painting in one day, it would have a I hope it would have a likeness to her, but may not actually feel like her, which is important to me. Um, I tend to use just primary colors, and I mix them because I want the color relationships to all be related. So I want as much control as possible over the paint and the paintwork. And I try to get as great a variety of calligraphy, meaning paint marks, both the size and the color of them um, in each painting. So that wherever you travel in it, you're sort of visually excited by every part of the painting, even if some of them, and I was explaining it earlier, that some of it should look like it's sort of not great paintwork, but but at the same time, it's it's great, not great paintwork, and others parts of it should look like it's it's really accomplished um, paintwork. So that I've got this this uh, always I want the most variety of everything I can have in my work. Um, I, does anybody have any questions? Because that's that's really the process of how I how I make it. Um, Explain. How many sittings I had to sit through? Oh, well, it, it, luckily she only had to sit through one sitting and it wasn't really a sitting. It was it was to get a, a, a photograph of Ellen that I could use. And I, of course, got many of them. So I was looking at several of them all the time. But there was one particular picture that, I, that I'd taken that I felt was it had the, the sizzle of Ellen that 
having only met her for a few minutes, I was like, oh, this is this is going to be a great portrait because I just loved the life in Ellen that I was that was being revealed to me as she took me around every square inch of this building and showed me absolutely everything that's in here, um, which was wonderful. And I really um, I'm gr so grateful to you for this project. It was just the best. And what an honor to hang in this room. I mean, really. And as you guys can see, it's it's a contemporary painting. It's going to be very different to what's here. So thank you for that also, because that also promotes contemporary painting, which is really important to me as a painter. And I think to everybody who has any connection to the arts and really any human being, because art is, for me, everything. Thank you very much. that it would change the look of the reading room. And it will, because we are, the American Antiquarian Society is a 21st century institution as it was a 20th century institution, as it was a 19th century institution. And this portrait helps us tell that story about the person who brought us into this century. Please join us across the street for a reception to honor the portrait, its painter, and its subject. Uh, immediately following this, this reception or this, this ceremony, um, we're just across the street in the Goddard Daniels house. Please join us for food and drink and conversation. Thank you so much for being here today to celebrate this day in the life of the American Antiquarian Society. So, uh,